Good morning. How are you guys? Oh, not well, I guess. Okay, all right. That's okay. Uh, no, I thank you for the scripture reading. I, hope, I I think we should have them do it every week. That's uh, that's that's the best one I've heard in a long time. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so today's gospel reading, as you just heard, is a story that we know well. Um, it's a story that we've heard since we were children. And I think there's a couple reasons why it makes for a good children's story. One is that when you're speaking with children, you have to compete against all sorts of things that grab their imagination. So it's nice to have a story that has this kind of super-powered twist to it, right? It's an, it's an exciting story, it can be. But perhaps even more importantly, it's an appropriate story for children because the message, the lesson of the story, is very simple for anyone to understand. The disciples are out on the sea and the waters are troubled, but even there in the midst of the storm, Jesus is there with them, right? Jesus comes to them. Jesus is present to them. Very simple message. Jesus will come to our help. But if the point of the story is the presence of Jesus in the midst of storms, then isn't it interesting how the story begins? Pay attention again. He says, the gospel says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. It's not as if the disciples have wandered away. It's not as if they got into this storm because they were somehow disobedient. Jesus sends them away, and Jesus sends the crowds away so that he can be alone. So something is going on here, right? For a little bit of context, I think it's interesting to note Maybe sometimes we've heard this story a million times, but have not paid attention to the chronology of events in Matthew's Gospel. In Matthew's Gospel, so much has happened in this very day. Earlier this morning, Jesus first received word that John the Baptist had been killed. And when he gets this message, Matthew says that he seeks to go away by himself. So he gets in the boat by himself. And he goes to find a deserted place. And when he comes ashore, there the crowds have already gathered, thousands of people. So here he is looking for solitude, looking for time and space to grieve his loss. But when he comes ashore, when he comes to his place that he thought would be his private place, thousands of people are there waiting for him. So. Naturally, he spends the day healing them, taking care of them. And by the time evening comes, the disciples have now caught back up to him. And he sees them there, Jesus with the crowds. And this is where Jesus tells them, ah, it's evening now. So he spent the whole day with these people. And he says, it's evening now. Before they go, uh, you should feed them. And of course, you know the story. They say, how can we feed them? We only have five loaves and two fish. And so he feeds the multitude. And it's right after he feeds the multitude that this is when our story picks up. So now, again, it makes sense why Jesus says, okay, now the day is finally over. You guys go on ahead. I'll send the crowds away. I am finally going to be alone. So, this story, which on the surface seems as if it is a story about God's enduring presence, is just as much a story of absence. Jesus experiences inner turmoil of grief and loss and pain, and so he sends the disciples away, not just so that he can be alone, but he sends them away into troubled waters. Jesus knows what they will encounter out there. The story, gospel, the, Matthew's gospel, as he narrates this, 
seems to indicate that the wind was blowing strong from the very beginning. So Jesus knows that he's sending them out into rough waters. But just as he must endure his own experience of suffering, he sends the disciples out to experience trouble of their own. And here I think we have lost sight of something so important. One of the major themes of Scripture that we see throughout, especially in the Old Testament, but I think we see it really in the book of Job, perhaps summarized best. This theme that I'm talking about is that God does not promise or give us any reason to expect that life will be easy. And so we have gotten it into our minds that everything good is from God, which is true, the Bible says that, but that anything that happens that we don't like must be contrary to what God wants. But that is not at all the case. Think again of the words of Job. He says, after losing everything and everyone in his life, what's his response? Right there in Job chapter 1. He says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And what's most interesting is that Scripture adds, in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with any wrongdoing. You see, for Job to say, the Lord has taken away from me my children. The Lord has taken away from me everything that I had. The Bible says in saying this, he was not charging God with any wrongdoing. You see, by acknowledging the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, he's not calling God evil. He's acknowledging the wisdom of God. He's submitting himself to the will of God. Consider, for instance, maybe a, 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 an example that might make this point a little bit clearer. Think of Paul, what he tells the Corinthians about this so-called thorn in the flesh. Now, we don't know exactly what Paul's thorn in the flesh was, but he's, he has something that causes him pain, perhaps physical pain or, or something spiritual, something emotional. But this is what he says to the Corinthians. He says, therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh. A messenger of Satan, he calls it, sent to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. You see, it's a mark of spiritual immaturity when we think that whenever we encounter misfortune or pain or loss, that it is contrary to the will of God. To be spiritually mature, as Paul is, is to recognize that God, in his wisdom, sends us into storms. And sometimes, like in our story this morning, he sends us there alone. So the story continues. By this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came, walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Now, you have to see the irony in this situation. That the predicament of the disciples has just gone from bad to worse. They've already been sailing all through the night on rough waters. And now it seems as if they're being haunted by some spirit from the underworld. And I think that in this, there's an important lesson in this situation, that the disciples have been sent out alone into stormy weather, and when the Lord does arrive, they don't recognize him. 
What the disciples think they see here is not entirely clear. It says in Greek, what they're calling this thing is a, a phantasm, a phantasm, an apparition. So perhaps they think that this is uh, the spirit uh, of some dead sailor, uh, perhaps someone who has himself drowned in these waters. Perhaps they think they're seeing uh, a sign of their own impending doom, right? Or perhaps they think they're seeing some kind of demon. Maybe they think that now here they are separated from their Lord, that the devil is seizing the opportunity to come and destroy them. But think about this, and I don't know what this will mean for you in your life, but I want you to think about this. We have to wonder whether or not in our own lives that when God appears to us, we might have mistaken it for something evil. The question we must ask ourselves is whether or not we will have the patience, the wisdom, the spiritual insight to see the presence of God in our fears and in our pains. So again, let's return to the words of the Apostle Paul, who three times he asked that this angel of Satan would be taken away from him. But in the end, he was able to see that this angel of Satan was actually from God. This thing that he says that was sent to torment him was a gift. That God gave him this pain for his own sake, to keep him humble, to keep him faithful. I mean, this is the mark of a real saint, a real spiritual giant that Paul can look at his own pain and say, God gave this to me to keep me from being too elated, to keep me from being too easygoing, to keep me from being too full of myself. God gave me this pain to remind me of my weakness and to keep me dependent on him. James writes something similar to us. He says, Whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. So as the disciples cry in fear at the appearance of this demon, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. But Peter is not yet convinced that this ghost is who he says he is. So Peter answered him, saying, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water, and he came toward Jesus. Now, this imagery of walking on water is interesting because it has so much potential meaning. We talk about walking on water, but think, for instance, in the Old Testament of the times in which God separates the waters and allows his people to walk through on dry land. Think of Moses splitting the Red Sea for the Israelites. Later, Elijah will split the Jordan River, allowing himself and Elisha to walk through. And this is interesting, I think, when we consider the fact that in Scripture, water is often something that represents chaos and turmoil. Think, for instance, of Genesis chapter 1. The world before God begins the creation is described as this deep and tumultuous ocean this primordial chaos. You see, the sea for people like the Israelites was always a kind of symbol of the unknown, of something treacherous, of something dangerous. So when God parts the waters and allows us to walk through on dry land, what does that mean but that it is that God gives us an escape from the trouble and suffering? is kept away from us. 
Yet when Christ stands on the sea, the wind still blows. The storm still rages. Christ does not take the disciples out of the waters. He does not yet calm the storm. On the contrary, he quite literally rises above it, and he invites Peter to do the same. So we may prefer that God split the waters for us. You get my meaning? We may prefer that troubles be taken away and pulled to the side that we can walk through on dry land. We may even pray as Paul did three times that God would take our troubles away from us. But just as Christ is greater than Moses and Elijah, so it is better to walk across stormy waters than to have the waters parted for us. And when Peter noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, You of little faith, why did you doubt? And you see, here's the key to the whole story. Here's the punchline, the moral, the lesson of the story. Peter is able to walk on water. He's able to rise above the storm because he has faith. But as he begins to doubt, he begins to sink. Now, this is not some generic platitude of, you know, if you believe it, you can achieve it, that kind of thing. It's not the lesson of this story. Faith is not a superpower. What faith provides in this circumstance is not that the winds die down or that the water recedes. Faith does not change our circumstances. What faith changes is our perspective. So you in your life today, as you encounter hardships of life, illness, grief, anxiety, loneliness, whatever it may be, I challenge you to pray over these things. Take them to God in prayer, and as Scripture says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Pray, if you must, as Paul did, that God might take these hardships away from you. But I challenge you this morning to come to the maturity that St. Paul reached when he learned to see God's strength in his own weakness. Learn to pray the words of our Lord, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Because faith does not always change our circumstances, but faith can change our perspective. Paul's thorn in the flesh was not there because he lacked faith. Do you understand that? Paul's suffering was not there because he was somehow spiritually weak. On the contrary, it was a sign of his strength in Christ. And it was faith that gave him the ability to see it as the gift that it was. Yet, how often are we like the crowds who taunt Jesus on the cross, saying, take yourself down from the cross. You've saved others, but you can't save yourself. See, did Jesus hang on the cross because he wasn't spiritually strong enough to come down from it? That he didn't have enough faith to ask God to rescue him, right? That's not at all what's happening. And it's the immaturity of the crowds that say, ah, here's a man on a cross. If he is such a man of God, why doesn't he come down? And so we, in our own lives, and our own circumstances, have to come to the same realization that we can't blame others' lack of faith for their suffering. And when we experience suffering, the question is not, oh, what have I done to deserve this? But what is God teaching me through this? If we have faith, then instead of fixating on the wind and the waves, instead of keeping our eyes on our problems and always asking God to take our troubles away, let us instead keep our eyes on Jesus.
Now again, to keep your eyes on Jesus may sound to many of you like a very sort of pious platitude, right? What does it mean to keep our eyes on Jesus? It means that we don't fixate on our problems. We don't obsess over what we wish was different, but we make our one and only priority in life to bring glory to God. That's the one thing we desire. The one thing that we keep our eyes on is him. So that our prayer, in in whatever circumstances you face, let your prayer be that God would be glorified. Not that you get what you want. Not that you get what even what you think is best for everyone. But that God would be glorified. Whenever I prepare for a message, that's my one and only prayer as I prepare. Not that it would go well, whatever that might mean. Not that you might receive a blessing, whatever that might mean. Not that I would be free from anxiety. Because whatever might happen here, as long as it glorifies God, that's all that matters. And if me getting up here and making a fool of myself and stumbling over every word, if that's what God needs to allow to happen, to keep me humble, or for God to be glorified, then so be it. So you, in your circumstance, whatever you face, let that be your prayer. Not that you get what you want, but that God would be glorified. That's what it means to keep your eyes on him. And with a faith like this, when God sends us into troubled waters, and even when the presence of God seems to us like a demon, if we have faith, We can make it through the storm, not around the storm, but through it. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. Go with us from this place with a sense of courage, with a sense of endurance. God, we pray for spiritual maturity, spiritual insight, Open our eyes to see the world as you see it, to see our pain as you see it. We thank you, Lord, for everything you give and for everything that you take away. And we ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.